Hi, thanks for having me here. Prof Vance has asked me to speak about my experience of the AFP, so I know why I'm here. Um, but I'd want to start off with a quick question to you. Why are you here? Um, I think the simple answer is to learn more about the AFP. So I want you to think deeper. Why are you here when you could be doing something else on your weekends? Take 30 seconds to think about that question. Write it down in the chat if you want. Um, or if you don't want to share, then on a piece of paper will be fine. And we'll revisit it later. Um, so while you're thinking about that, I'll let you know a little bit about me. Um, so I did my medical training in Newcastle. I had my first exposure to academia when I was um, when I did an audit in fourth year. And I liked the feeling as though I was making a difference rather than just following the rules or rote learning things. I then did an MRes in transplantation as I liked immunology and surgery. And I put all my eggs into one basket and went hard on transplant. I did an AFP in Cambridge in transplantation and thought perhaps it wasn't for me. Um, so I took a year out to make up my mind. And when I did that, I also did a PG cert. I ended up doing an ACF in urology as I decided I want to sleep when I was a consultant. Um, so back to our question, why are you here? Um, you might already be interested in research. You might be on the fence. Perhaps you've done a little bit of research and you want to hear more. And maybe it'd be something nice for your CV. And I think broadly speaking, these are the main reasons that people apply to the ACF or AFP. Um, so what's my role going to be here today? Um, I'm going to talk to you about why you should consider the AFP, um, how you could get the most out of your AFP, career progression afterwards, and if you have any questions as we go along, please drop them in the chat. Um, so first things first, um, we'll look at why you should consider the AFP. Uh, we'll discuss what the point of an AFP is, what it offers you, um, alternatives to normal applications um, and academic projects. So first of all, what's the point of an AFP? Um, it's an introduction to the integrated academic pathway. Um, the aim from a purely institutional point of view is to generate clinicians who are trained in research um, and have time to perform research. But what does it offer you? The main benefits are exposure to research, dedicated academic time, either day release, a four month block or variations around that. And this allows you to develop your research skills and also transferable skills. Gives you an opportunity to network with a team you might not have exposure to normally. Um, and a small number of deaneries offer extra things like academic teaching courses um, and training, uh, PG certs and research bursaries. And all of these things make it easier to progress along that academic training pathway. Um, it's also an alternative to the normal job application, um, as well as those reasons um, I discussed before. Uh, when I was at med school, I was good at taking exams, but I excelled in extracurriculars and interviews. The AFP gave me an opportunity to get a job by playing to my strengths rather than worrying about doing well in the SJT. AFPs also tend to be linked to teaching hospitals, so it's an alternative route to get the plum jobs too. For example, I knew I wanted to do surgery and out of my six foundation rotations, three were surgical and one was research. It also gives you two bites of the cherry at competitive job applications such as London. Admittedly, the AFPs do have a, um, a five to one competition ratio on average, so it'll be more competitive in those locations too. But the main attraction of the AFP is the academic project. Some are themed AFPs, um, and they might have specific speciality themes, or they might go beyond medical research, for example, leadership and med ed. Overall, there's a large amount of autonomy. Some AFPs are very flexible, but admittedly, some are quite inflexible too. And this might help inform where you want to apply. Um, I did my AFP in Cambridge, and I had ultimate flexibility. I could choose exactly what I wanted to do, and, I didn't have to be, and it didn't have to be related to the transplant theme at all. I know some people who did ophthalmology research on my transplant themed AFP. Um, but some to that, some, for some people that might be a downside as there was zero structure and we had to organize everything. I think the London AFPs might be slightly less flexible, but I might be wrong. Um, and even if you don't get your AFP, it's still good interview practice um, for your core training interviews. 
So how to get the most out of your AFP. Um, in this section, we'll talk about setting a goal, finding a supervisor in a project, thinking beyond the project, outputs, how you can use role models to help inform what you want to do, um, the role of networking, taste the weeks, extracurricular activities, and then some of the negatives about doing an AFP. So first of all, um, how to make the most of it. Um, if we go back to your reason for why you're here today, you can probably use that to set yourself a broad goal for your AFP. So for example, if you're already interested in research, you can use your project to go in something in more depth. If you've not done that much research before and you're not sure about it, you can use it as a time to figure out whether you like it or not. And you can use it as a chance to do things um, that will prepare you for core training as well. So the first step is to set yourself a goal. I think the primary aim should be to figure out whether you actually like research or not. And if you do, what sort of research do you like? Um, you can use it as a time to help you figure out what specialty you want to do. And you can then use this to help you start thinking about your life plan. I wouldn't focus too much on outputs um, during this time, but we'll discuss that in more detail later. Um, so the first step um, is to find a supervisor. And my tips for this would be to plan early. So really, you should be thinking about this before you even apply for your AFP. For example, I knew I wanted to, um, to uh, work with Professor Nicholson um, at Cambridge, who is an expert in ex vivo organ perfusion. So I sent him a message um, before I'd applied for the AFP um, to see what sort of projects I could be involved in. Um, and I spoke to other, other people there too to figure out whether it would be a good option. So start, once you're in your AFP, um, you should then seriously start organising it, um, organising your F2 research block when you're in F1. Because particularly if you're organising things like ethics or patient recruitment, it can take longer than four months. So you might end up spending your entire research block organising things without actually doing any research. My next tip would be to talk to multiple supervisors. Explore things you can do, what your role in their team would be, um, and also look at their publishing record. Um, are they publishing? Who are they working with? And speak to their students too. What do they think of the team and is it a nice environment to work in? Once you've heard from the supervisors, you'll get a broad idea of what sort of projects you can do. Um, alternatively, if you know what project you want to do, you can do it the other way around by focusing more on the project and then trying to align that with the potential supervisors. Um, and depending on the flexibility of your AFP, um, you can do pretty much any project, but people tend to do preclinical work, such as lab projects, um, but also some data science. You might also do clinical work, um, so patient recruitment, um, clinical database analysis, um, involved in audit, but m sort of um, more commonly, there are also these leadership and management AFPs and also education AFPs. So there's, there's scope to do anything really. Um, so how do you figure out what sort of project to choose? This can sometimes be quite difficult. And what you can do to help yourself is to think about what you enjoy and what you dislike. And um, that's obviously obvious, but think about why. Try and be as specific as possible. Um, patterns then emerge and you can use these to inform and refine your choices. You can do the same for what specialty you want to do as well. For example, um, can you bear doing cell culture? If not, um, then you probably want to avoid cellular biology. And you also think need to think about what's achievable. Um, a four months, four months is quite a long time, but it's also quite a short time in terms of research. Um, particularly if you've got a day release program you might struggle to do a lab project. Um, next thing is to try not to take too much on board um, and don't be afraid to say no. Um, and this is something that I still struggle with. So it's really a skill that you should be trying to perfect um, as you go along. Um, and make sure you finish any project that you do start with them. Um, finally, have a backup plan. Um, what happens if you can't do your main project? So for example, um, one of my ideas would be to do some data anal an analysis on my, my AFP, but unfortunately we couldn't get access to the data in time, even though I'd organised it um, in my F1 block 
um, we still couldn't get access to the data. So I had to have a backup plan for that. So I ended up doing a systematic review as well. Um, and I'd encourage you to think beyond your project. So four months is a long time. Um, you won't have to do any on calls and you'll have so much time to do things. You'll have time to go and see that weird operation or clinic you wanted to watch. Um, you can do teaching or be the chair of some society. Maybe have a side hustle or a hobby that you'd want to spend more time doing. I think the strength of the AFP is not necessarily the project you do, but the time you have to explore whatever you want. And you might end up doing a research project that's not particularly successful, but because you had the time to spend doing the things you enjoyed and the things you were interested outside of the project, you got much more out of your AFP. And with that in mind, I'd encourage you to be opportunistic. Know your ABCD, always be collecting data and think, can I get an output out of this? And not just publications, but say you're doing a teaching session. Um, think about the feedback you can get. Collecting that data um, might be something that you can put in your portfolio later. And while it's good to be ambitious, um, it can be difficult to achieve anything in four months. Um, it's unlikely that you'll get a nature paper out of this, although one of my friends did. I'm not salty at all about that. Um, and I found this study very interesting. Um, they asked 56 AFPs uh, what their outcomes were from their time during their AFP. 60% um, wrote up a study for publication. 70% published their uh, presented their results in a meeting. And if I'm honest, I think those percentages are quite low. Um, I think everyone should be able to present at a local meeting, even if you don't finish your project. Um, you can still present your preliminary data or give people an update on what you're doing. Um, I did all of these outcomes except three of the educational ones, um, which was sort of focusing around curriculum design. Um, and I think you can get a lot done um, and these are sort of an idea of what sorts of things you might have as an output. But as I said before, um, I don't think the main aim of the AFP should be outcomes. Um, I think it should be to figure out whether you like research or not. But if you do want outcomes, um, aim to get the most out of everything you do before you even start doing it. One of my friends would refer to the holy trinity of outcomes, a poster, an oral presentation and a publication. And if this is your aim for every project, while well, you might not get all three for everything you do, you'll end up with a lot of stuff on your CV. Um, you also don't need to just aim for the best journal and international presentations. These are very difficult, particularly at your stage. Instead, think about easier options like local presentations, non-PubMed indexed um, journals or student journals um, and conference abstracts too. These might seem pointless um, because they don't count towards FPAS, but they pad out your white space questions. Um, they stress, show a strong research ethic. And also some ST3 applications want second authorships, some want non-PubMed indexed um, publications. So although they might not seem um, the most useful at this point, they are in fact very useful um, longer term. And you can list anything on your CV, so why not? Um, with this in mind, I'd encourage you to pick the low-hanging fruit. Often the projects that students and AFPs get um, during medical school or the AFP block aren't the most amazing because remember you're still learning how to do research. Um, and because of this, it can mean it's harder to publish or present some of these things. And unless you're publishing, um, trying to publish a case report on your grandma's pneumonia, um, you'll be able to publish almost anything if you try hard enough. This is one of my favorite articles. Um, it focuses on, um, uh, it's an educational article, um, but you can apply the same strategies for your own research. It has a great table in it that shows you all the places that you can publish things. Um, but it's also, it's not all about publishing. It's all about, it's also about making your life easier for yourself. Um, so as well as uh, seeking out those easy publication types like for example, writing a full research paper is very difficult. Um, if you've not done much writing before, you can seek out case reports, letters, editorials, reviews, collaborative authorships. These are much quicker to write. It takes months to write a research, to take a research project um, from start to submit it. 
it took me one day to write a case report that I published. Um, and you'll never write that nature paper when it finally comes if you can't write something simple. But like I say, it's not all about the publications. Um, you can make your life easier by finding a mentor. And that's not just your academic senior supervisor, but someone who can actually teach you research skills, so a PhD or a postdoc. You can also collaborate with others on your research. For example, um, you could run an experiment for someone else. In return, they'd help you run some of your, your experiments. Um, or you could write up the introduction for someone's project and in return they could do the same and then you're getting your name on multiple publications essentially by doing the same amount of work. Um, one of my friends used um, an analogy to describe research outputs which I thought was quite good. He described that you have a kicking game and a defensive game. Your kicking game are your major successes, the international oral presentations, major prizes, publications in high impact journals. But if you only focus on kicking, you're probably going to lose the game because that only forms a minor part of it. Instead, you also need to focus on slowly gaining ground consistently over time. These are your local presentations, your case reports, and some of the smaller outputs. If you have a good defensive game, you might only need one kick to win the match. Um, but it's not easy to know what to do, what prizes or grants are available. Um, what positions you could apply for. And one way you can do that, or you can figure out what's available, is by looking at what other people are doing. People generally like to show off what they want, or show off their achievements, particularly on LinkedIn. Um, so if you search for AFP at whichever deanery, ACF at whatever other deanery, you can have a look at what they've done. And this will give you an idea of what you can do, both in terms of research projects, but also extracurriculars, prizes, societies you can apply for, and things like that. So let's have a look at an example. This is Sarah, who kindly agreed for me to share her bio with you. Let's have a look at what she's done. So in addition to her AFP and her ACF, she's also done an integrated bachelor's degree, a master's of public health, um, and she's involved in global surgery and international groups. She's done some teaching and has developed some educational resources. I love looking at what other people have done. Um, for example, with Sarah, I didn't realize that there was a WFNS, a World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. Um, and you can use this role modeling to see what opportunities there are for you. For example, maybe you're interested in dermatology. Perhaps you want to set up uh, a World Federation of Dermatology Societies. Um, I will caveat this point though, um, when you're looking at people's bios, um, don't be too hard on yourself. Um, remember that um, you don't have to work all the time and that someone will probably always be better than you. Um, as depressing as that sounds, it will make it a lot easier um, when you're looking at these things because there are some very impressive people out there. Um, you'll never get something by not applying. Um, and what do you have to lose? only time and a bruised ego. Um, but we can avoid the second by embracing failure as a learning experience. I've applied to so many things and been rejected, papers, grants, positions, and the first few times it really hurts. But after that, it becomes much easier. It still stings a bit, but it's never as bad as the first time. Um, when you do get rejected, always ask for feedback and reflect on it. You can learn so much each time and it can help you identify gaps in your CV too. And most of these things, most of the time, these things don't really matter. Um, there are so many journals you can apply for, so many grants and so many prizes. Um, so you're bound to get a few if you apply to enough of them. And by learning from the things that don't matter, it increases your chances of getting the things that do matter. Um, and success breeds success. I'm pretty sure this is my dad's favorite phrase. Um, and apparently it's been scientifically proven. Me being here right now is an example of that. Um, and in this study, they showed that you only need a small amount of success early on um, for it to generate a big difference. So by attending this talk today, um, by learning how you can do these things, hopefully um, an early case report, learning those skills might be all that's required to succeed. But it is a balance. Um, 
avoiding the first problem um, that we described in that applying to a lot of things can waste time um, is difficult. Um, but it can be achieved by limiting the amount of time you spend applying to these things. Um, for example, when I was at medical school, I entered a lot of essay competitions. Um, why? Two reasons. My primary aim um, was to improve my writing style and my speed. Um, and obviously the added the secondary aim was to potentially win a, win a prize, and that was an added benefit. Um, but as the likelihood of winning the prize is quite low, I'd limit the amount of time I spent on each of the essays I was writing. So I'd only spend one and a half days maximum on each essay. And that way, if I didn't win, it didn't really matter as I hadn't wasted a whole week writing something. The other thing you can think about is recycling your waste. Um, so if you make an application to something, save it. That way, the next time you apply, you can use it again. Hopefully all of it, but definitely parts of it. Um, and for essays, if they're rejected, try and use it for something else. Maybe submit it to a student journal. Um, I didn't understand how important networking was when I started in academia um, and when I was at med school, medical school. But it is very important. Um, I'd recommend all the um, foundation year doctors to get Twitter. Um, it's a really useful resource. Um, it allows you to network with literally anyone um, you can send anyone a message. They may or may not reply. Um, more often than not, though, they do. And that means that you've got essentially access to the entire world's um, experts. You can ask anyone any question. Um, for medical students, maybe, maybe you want to consider joining Twitter, maybe not. Um, I think it can induce a little bit of anxiety. Um, I wasn't on Twitter as a medical student, and I'm quite glad I wasn't in a way because um, I think I would have got anxious about it because um, you can be overexposed to all these opportunities um, and you can feel as though you need to work all the time. You don't. You can you can relax. Uh, you need to work hard, um, but you, you don't need to work the entire time. Networking, though, allows you to find out the insider information that's not often published. So if you're not on Twitter, um, it would be worthwhile speaking to people about where you want to go so, for example, speaking to the current AFPs, if you're med finally a medical student, speaking to them can help you find out the insider information about uh, the AFP project or AFP project or AFP um, in that deanery that you want to, to apply to. Um, if you're a current foundation trainee, I'd encourage you to do a taste a week as well during your AFP block, simply because it can be very difficult to know um, what specialty you want to do, even if you're sure it can allow you to maybe um, see a really niche part of that specialty. For example, not many centers offer andrology, urology research. That's pretty niche. Um, so if you're interested in that, if, if you're interested in urology like me, maybe you'd want to do that. Um, and uh, there's this article, I'd really recommend it. I hear it's quite good. Um, and that, that, te that can sort of, walk you through all the things you'd need to do to do a taste a week. Um, I'd also encourage you to do something fun. Um, spending your entire time at med school or foundation training focusing solely on research means your CV will probably be quite a boring read and you will be probably pretty bored. Um, and unless you've got an amazing project, um, it probably won't stand out. So have a think about what your unique selling point is. Maybe you run a sport uh, or maybe you do a sport or you run a society, something like that. Um, I'd aim to be as rounded as possible um, for your own sanity, uh, if nothing else. Um, so what are the downsides to doing an AFP? Well, research is difficult. It's frustrating um, when your experiment fails and you have to repeat it, especially if, if it's the fourth or fifth time it happens. It can take a huge amount of time to do research, not just the project, but the write-up, preparing posters, things like that. And most of the work is done outside of working hours, so you don't get paid. And it's time that you could be doing a locum too. You need to hit deadlines. So last week I stayed up until midnight one day um, because I needed to make changes to a paper um, so we could submit the results to a conference by the deadline. Um, and you'll need to make sacrifices. So I wrote this presentation um, on a night shift 
uh, last week when I could have been sleeping or I could have been watching a film or something like that. Um, and it's also lonely as well. Um, simply starting a new job in a new city on an academic block means you won't have as much exposure um, to everyone who's doing the normal foundation program. Um, and running experiments in the lab, sometimes they'll be running at weird hours. Often you'll just be doing the experiments alone. Um, so it can be a little bit lonely. Um, these two studies uh, by Bogad and um, Borelli um, looked at some of the other problems that students encountered. So there was a lack of structure. Um, like I say, you've really got to drive your own project most of the time. Someone won't really, they won't really be looking at what you're doing. Um, they won't be chasing you. You have to be driving it. Um, there's also variable experiences between trainees. So some will have a really good time. Some might have uh, and get loads of stuff out of it. Some might have a really difficult time. Um, and that, I think, is the benefit of speaking to people who've done it before. Um, they'll be able to give you that insider info about what worked, what didn't work, and why. Um, four months is quite a long time, but it's also quite a short time in terms of research. So if you think about someone doing a PhD, that's three years long, um, and they're going to get an output out of that. And even then, some people struggle um, to get outputs out of that. So four months is, isn't very long, but equally, it can be a very long time. You can get a lot of stuff out of it. Um, you also have to apply while you're at medical school and it might conflict with exams you have or maybe learning. Um, and your AFP comes out after your um, foundation offer. Uh, so it comes out before your foundation offer. Um, so it might be hard if you don't get your top choice AFP because you might be thinking, well, I've got an AFP in one city, but I don't really want to be there. Should I wait until I get my foundation offer? Um, and see if I get it in my top choice. Um, the other, on the other hand, um, if you get the right location but you don't get your first choice AFP and you're in a place that has an inflexible AFP program, you might end up doing a project in a specialty you don't want to. Um, so that's difficult too. AFP blocks are also unbanded, so you make less money in theory. Um, you can do loads of locums and um, uh, yeah, you can you can make you can actually make more money on your AFP um, by doing night shifts at the weekend or on calls at the weekend. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, oh, and um, it's also not always fun. Um, sometimes it's type one fun, but mostly it's type two fun. Uh, something that commonly comes up is, are you missing out on your clinical training? I would say no, you are not. Um, in my opinion, foundation training largely misses the training part. Um, you only miss four months and most likely those four months will be a scribe, will, will be you being a scribe on medical ward rounds. Um, you won't struggle to fill your competencies. I did half of mine in a week. It's really not difficult. So if you have a modicum of organizational skills, you'll be absolutely fine. Um, Jill asked me to share some of my interesting AFP outputs. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the foundation program is a great time to explore other things you're interested in. Um, so although I did get a couple of, um, I did work on a couple of projects, um, to be honest, they weren't that interesting. I feel as though my interesting outputs were the things I did outside of my um, AFP block. Um, I started a society at university called We Are Donors um, and during my AFP we grew it into a charity. Um, so we give talks to, organ, talks to schools about organ donation and over the two years of my AFP block we built a community consisting of nine groups in the UK um, and we spoke to over 3,500 students. Um, and by exploring this interest, um, first of all, I enjoyed it a lot, but also we won loads of prizes um, from universities, uh, international and national conferences, and we were awarded grants for our work. And if anyone's interested in, um, maybe you, you don't have a leadership position, um, if anyone's interested in setting up uh, a group at their university, please send me an email. And how did I come up with this idea to turn my society into a charity? Well, I saw an AFP had set up a charity on their LinkedIn page when I was looking at that in final year. And I thought I could do that. Um, 
I also started a journal, again, by expanding on some of the work I'd done as a medical student. Um, I worked with the National Students Association of Medical Research to found a journal, and I was editor-in-chief of the first two issues. Um, and I'd encourage everyone to submit something to that. And the link's there if you need it. Um, so essentially, the world is your oyster. You can do anything um, during your AFP. So thinking beyond the AFP, um, I won't spend too long on this, as I know Will will be talking about this um, in more depth. However, it's worthwhile having a short-term plan um, and a long-term plan. So what will I be doing in the next year or two? And what will I be doing in the next five years? So if you're an AFP currently, one way you can help yourself and help plan is by thinking about um, the ACF and ST3 criteria. Um, if you don't end up applying for an ACF, you'll still have ticked all of the boxes for the ST3 criteria by looking at it. So it's worthwhile. Um, and here are some resources. Um, I'll touch on these in a little bit, sorry. Um, so I didn't apply for the AFP, a ACF um, or core training in my F2 um, because I knew I wanted to do research, but as I said before, I wasn't re really sure which to choose, um, whether transplant or urology. And with the ACF, you're locked into it. Um, so it's a 10 year program, the ACF. Um, so I took a year out um, as an anatomy demonstrator. I did a bit more urology and found that was a good fit, but I still wasn't really 100% sure. Um, so I applied for the Cambridge ACF in transplant and the Oxford ACF in urology. And in the end, I was fortunate enough to get both. So that scuppered my plan to make my decision a little easier. Um, but I think it shows that uh, if you do your academic preparation well, it doesn't matter so much um, if you change your mind about what specialty you want to do later. I think it does help knowing what you want to do early on um, because you can put all your eggs in one basket. But if you change your mind later, that can make it slightly more challenging, but it's not impossible. I did it and I know people who did ENT, um, all ENT, and then they changed their mind and now they're a general surg surgical ACF. Um, so it doesn't matter if you change your mind. Um, but beyond AFP, um, I think you have to be genuinely interested in research. Um, and I don't think it's worthwhile applying if you're just doing it for your CV. It's far too much work. Um, and you really, you're taking away someone else's place and you won't get the most out of it. So I wouldn't recommend that. Um, and you don't need loads of publications. I think I had three when I applied for ACF, um, but you do need a unique selling point. Um, so I think it'd be worthwhile working on that. Um, so for further reading, for medical students, these are two articles I'd recommend. Um, they summarise the positives and negatives well um, and how to apply as well. Uh, they also publish the white space questions in advance now, which they didn't when I applied. We only had a week to write ours. And I think even if you're not um, in the position to apply, so you're in non-final year and you're watching this talk, I think it might be worthwhile having a look at those anyway because um, it might help you see if there are any gaps in your CV that you might want to fill in the time you, you have left. Um, and for foundation doctors who are interested in applying to the ACF, um, they publish the interview shortlisting criteria. So it's worthwhile having a look at those in advance, and you can see those in Appendix 5 of that article, or that, that, uh, that um, report. Um, so you just essentially you just need to try and work through that and tick every box on there. Um, some of them are quite difficult, so you might not get them. Um, I didn't have all of them, and I still got my ACF. Um, but it's worthwhile having a look at those, and then also the core and specialty training portfolio schemes as well to help you plan what you might want to do. Um, so in summary, we've talked about what the AFP can offer you, strategies for making the most of your AFP, um, and you can also apply these more generally to research at any time. Um, and we've also talked uh, briefly about uh, how to start making a plan for the future um, and how that can help you um, in your future too. Uh, so I want you to reflect on the following questions. Why do you want to do research and be specific about that? Um, what specialty project or supervisor might want you to, might 
might you want to pursue and again be specific um, are there any missing outputs from what you're already doing and can you squeeze the pips from anything you've done anymore what's your unique selling point what extracurricular activities are you doing um, and taking all of this into account what's your plan for the next two years I started getting inter interested in research I'm in my fourth year of my medical degree and um, I sort of seriously considered um, the AFP about 18 months before before applying and before then I didn't really have anything um, on my CV so you can do quite a lot in that amount of time and if you've left it until the last minute again I wouldn't worry you can often um, piece together all the things you've done um, into something that tells quite a nice story anyway so um, thank you very much for listening um, I'll be able to I'm happy to answer any questions if you just post them in the chat um, and these are some opportunities you might be interested in um, as I discussed previously we're looking to set up new university groups um, and you can send me an email um, on that email address if you have some things um, that you want to you think might be suitable to publish in a student journal um, I'm not involved in this anymore I've passed the baton on to someone else um, but I'd highly encourage you to do it it's really good at getting um, uh, sort of honing your research skills and writing skills and also if you if you don't have any publications and maybe you want a collaborative authorship um, you can get involved in this um, collaborative that we're running um, and you can find out more information about all of these um, on the links or by sending emails. Thank you very much. Hi, so my name is Zaid. I am an F1 in West London and I just completed the Medics Academy training and teaching day three course. I think it's structured in a really nice way with a lot of resources can permanently access the course isn't over after three days you've got a ton of online content that you can always revisit and I think that is fantastic. I thought it was a great way to learn through having a full day at the start and then two later days of self-study it really allowed for flexibility and allowed us to fully engage in the course. And it also made me feel better uh, prepared to deliver teaching remotely or digitally it's really interactive. There's a lot of small group uh, feedback session, exchanging ideas uh, and learning people's perspective. After actually doing this course, I realized that teaching is more of a science and it's really important to get clear feedback so that you can improve your teaching. This course also encouraged me to think thoroughly about what my audience actually wants from my teaching session and also how I can keep them um, better engaged really great and fantastic to get such fantastic lectures from experts in the field throughout the three days. It was also interesting to learn from others taking part on the course because we all have different levels of experience so it was interesting to gain their perspective on things too. I learned not just about a different style of teaching, um, I also learned about uh, what is medical education, how to build a career in medical education. Overall I learned a lot from the teaching course. I think it's a really well done course. I really enjoyed it. And I really, really found it very enjoyable. That's what I thought of the whole course and I really enjoyed it and I would recommend it to other people. So thank you for letting me participate.